Okay. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, Pete Morsuti here, uh, regional paramedic educator for the SWARB. To my left, I have Natalie Pichet, who is a Windsor midwife. Say hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Can you all hear me okay? Uh, I have Michelle Fraser on the other end, who will be receiving your emails and questions and then forwarding to me as we uh, go along. Um, I am waiting on Dr. Bradford to come in. He's stuck in a meeting. He sends his apologies. He will be here shortly to help address any uh, situations that we may have. So at any time, feel free to send in any free uh, questions or anything you guys want to know about. We're going to walk through the presentation on midwives. Um, this came about during the summertime. Uh, we got together with the midwives and did a little presentation over at St. Clair College. And uh, we thought it would be beneficial to share it with the whole SWARB region. So sit back and enjoy the uh, presentation. And like I said, if you have any questions, we'll uh, proceed as we go on. And here we go. Okay. Let me uh, try and get control of my screen here. This is... Uh, There we go. So the preamble, in the summer of 2012, an educational opportunity was developed from Midwives Ontario and Corporation of Essex, Windsor EMS, and our SWAR. Information was essential uh, to collaborative practice, and it was a great learning experience. And like I said earlier, we needed to share it with the rest of our colleagues. So what is the preamble? What is a midwife? Uh, midwife is a primary caregiver specializing in pregnancy, labor, and birth. He slash she has been formally trained midwife education programs and duly recognized in the country in which it is located. He or she must be registered with the College of Midwives of Ontario to practice in Ontario and also part of the Association of Midwives. Right. So let's enjoy the fruits of our labor. Many of us have probably been in this uh, situation, so hopefully we can get a little more education behind it. So learning objectives. With this webinar, uh, we'll be able to describe what a midwife is and his or her role in the birthing process. Describe a midwife's medical training and how he or she is regulated. And establish when a midwife might call 911 and when he or she might treat a patient while en route to hospital. And then determine whether paramedics or midwives are responsible for the patient. I guess that's the biggest question and the reason we're doing this uh, presentation. So we outline for the discussion. Midwives, who are they and what they do, obviously. Discuss the training. What are the midwives' criteria for calling 911? And when 911 arrives, who's in charge? All right, and hopefully by that time, Dr. Bradford will be here to help us and guide us through some of those big questions. So, I'll uh, just put Natalie on the spot a little bit. I'm going to ask her to give us a brief description of who, what, when, and where she got her education and what she does. And uh, please be patient with her. She was up all night. Um, so I'm originally from Sudbury. Um, I did my formal training at Laurentian University. Um, it's a four-year university degree. Um, it's a year and a half of theory and two and a half years of clinical. Um, Unfortunately, I didn't get any of my choices in my senior year, so that's how I ended up here in Windsor, um, which has worked to my benefit in the last five and a half years. Um, the program is specially designed for midwives. Um, in other words, if you do the formal training, there is no crossover courses, so if you don't like it, you're kind of out of luck. Um, but I've been blessed to really enjoy what I do and really couldn't see myself doing um, anything else. So along with my four years of university, so the Bachelor of Science in Midwifery, I'm also trained in adult CPR, neonatal resuscitation, as well as emergency skills that we'll go through later on in the presentation um, how often we actually certify um, in these courses. Oh, thanks, Anna. How long have you been doing this again? Um, a total of three and a half years here in Windsor. Yeah, awesome. So what is Midway? So like Natalie said, she was admitted to the Midwifery Educational Program successfully completed it and um, describes courses of her studies, has acquired the uh, requisite qualifications to be registered and or legally licensed to practice, and she's considered the primary caregiver on the scene. Right? Midwives are re responsible and accountable. Okay? 
work in partnership with women to provide support and advice during pregnancy, labor, and the postpartum period. So you begin right at the beginning. Yeah, so we labor. provide um, prenatal care. Um, the way midwifery works is it's self-referral, so they don't need a referral uh, from their family physician, nurse practitioner, um, and they come and see us. We can order all the necessary tests, medications, and ultrasounds they would need. Um, in terms of clinical care, they receive everything they would get with an obstetrician. So they're seeing us once a month up until they're 28 weeks. We're seeing them then every other week till they're 36 weeks, and then we see them once a week up until they're ha um, until they have their baby. Um, in other words, during a regular prenatal visit, we're doing blood pressure assessment, um, uterine palpation, fetal heart rate assessment. So essentially, everything you would get under the care of an obstetrician, um, you get with a midwife. Excellent, excellent. Just going to ask you to speak a little louder. Some okay. of our clients are uh, not hearing so well this morning. So important. One of the important tasks for a midwife is the health, counseling, and education, right? But it's not only for the women. They also provide um, family and community support, right? Involves the antenatal education, like she explained, and may extend to women's health, sexual reproductive health, and child care. And I know that, um, what do you call it, our health care system is changing. So when a lot of people are going to the out-of-hospital birth, Right. And what I will just throw in there is um, one of the models of care put out by the College of Midwives is actually informed choice. Um, so all of our clients, um, and this applies to tests, medications, ultrasound, choice of birthplace, um, are provided with college guidelines, society of obstetrician guidelines, um, so that they can be the primary decision maker and make informed choices in regards to their care. Awesome. So, legal status. Everybody wanted to know about the legal status. So, is a midwife recognized in Canada? Midwifery is recognized and is legal and is a legal and regulated profession in some Canadian provinces and territories. Not all, after my research, not all the provinces recognize no. midwifery. So, maybe you can elaborate on that. I know in Ontario, midwives are regulated, as you guys can see on the screen. But I don't know, is it province? I can't remember if it's Alberta or Saskatchewan, one of those. They don't accept them. Um, they are recognized in Alberta. Um, when I was going through the program, there was a lot of students from Alberta training here. So I'm not 100% um, convinced that they have a formal education program, but they are regulated and they do have an association out there and they are allowed to practice. They're just funded a little bit differently than we are, whereas we're funded by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. And um, it's essentially the patient if they have, the patient has to pay for it in those province. Pay for service. Interesting. So, the Midwifery Act 91 tells us that the, the practice of midwifery is the assessment and monitoring of women. So during labor, during pregnancy, labor, postpartum period, and newborn baby, and newborn baby, provisions of care during normal pregnancy and labor, and conducting and the conducting of spontaneous normal vaginal delivery. Is that all that's where it's supposed to be? Is that, or is there more to that? Has that changed? Uh, no, that's pretty much um, midwifery care, um, prenatal care, labor and delivery, as well as six weeks postpartum. Okay. All right. Uh, I guess there's a hand up. So um, if Michelle can help me out here, and we can see. There, I guess there's a question. Or if you feel free, can you email your questions to Michelle and she'll relay them to me? Okay, so let's move it on. Oops, right back on my screen here. Sorry, folks. So midwifery schools, as Michelle, or Natalie explained earlier, sorry, Michelle. Uh, midwifery education in Canada leads to a four-year bachelor level degree in midwifery. There are seven schools in Canada in Ontario is offered at the following universities as you can see. So McMaster University in Hamilton, Ryerson out of Toronto, and Laurentian up in Sudbury. Natalie's the graduate of them. So regulated midwives in Canada. They can prescribe and administer certain medications, order the appropriate tests during pregnancy, deliver babies at home, in hospital, or in birthing centers. At this point, how welcome are you in hospitals? Um, here in Windsor, we're quite welcome. Uh, we work very well with all the nurses and doctors. 
I mean, we've worked really hard on that um, over the past six to seven years that we've been here in Windsor. Um, we, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Moral B program, so we all um, in our office sit on the Moral B team, as well as um, committees with all the physicians, nurses, and doctors. So, like I said, we're quite welcome here in Windsor, and I know in certain other cities that may not be the case, but they're all working very hard to build those relationships. Okay. So midwifery care, right, provide care for healthy pregnant women. Now, all women have to be healthy in your care, correct? Absolutely. Um, we care for the low risk population, not the high risk, um, which accounts for about 95% of all pregnancies. Okay. Um, joining us is Dr. Bradford. He was uh, in a meeting. He started from being late. So he's going to log in here. So if we have any questions that pop up, let me know. Go from there. Uh, so they offer, like it says on the screen, prenatal testing such as blood work, ultrasound, and other tests were indicated. They offer postnatal care in the early postpartum period. Midwives are on call 24/7 for labor and urgent concerns. And you worked last night till early yeah. this morning. So just like any doctor, nurse, paramedic, are on call 24/7. And then they maintain regular clinic hours. What are your clinic hours like? Um, I do clinic on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, so our, our clinic is basically run like a physician's office and that's the way it works in our office is that we're each given a day to do our full clinic. Um, if we're at a birth and we have to cancel, then our clinic kind of rolls into other days. Yeah. Alright, we have a question that came through. Bill Macri, how do we know that they are a midwife? Do they have certain ID badges or tags that you carry? Um, we do have hospital pegs, but we don't wear them when we're in the home setting. Uh, so we would identify ourselves to you. Um, and then we, when we call for EMS, we definitely identify who we are um, and what we're needing. Okay. But no formal badge um, when we're at home. All right. Uh, Rod sent the question in. He says, uh, what complications during the pregnancy would lead you to pass a patient off to an obstetrician? Um, gestational diabetes, pregnancy-induced hypertension, preterm labor. Um, we got a slide coming up. Yeah. Yeah. We do have a slide coming up with all that on it, Rod. So two slides. Two. No, actually, I changed it to three. Is it? <laughs> There's been a few updates made. So, so how do mid midwives monitor clients through pregnancy? Right. Blood pressure, as Natalie explained earlier, the growth of the baby, the baby's heart rate position. Provide your analysis, monitor general overall health of the mother and baby. There's now two clients involved. Um, see clients once a month to the 28th week. Is that correct? Yep. All right. And that's the same as physicians, I think, right? Absolutely. They're doing the family doctor office, I think. Yep. Then uh, every second week to the 36th week, and then weekly until the baby is born. So if complications develop, the midwife will consult the appropriate health care provider, as for the college midwives guidelines for mandatory consultation and transfer care. Provide home visits when home births are planned so they can become familiar with the location. What At which stage do you start going to the home to actually investigate the home? So we do, um, for those clients providing home births, we do um, a routine home visit around 37 weeks. At that visit there, um, we give every single one of our clients um, the first two lines of antihemorrhagic drugs. Um, we go through the risk of uh, a home birth and the management. So when we would transport into hospital, when we would call EMS, um, so that they could make an informed um, decision. But we only do one home visit antenatally. Oh, excellent. Then they provide continuous support from, from the active stage of labor. And there, and I am correct, there's two midwives that attend the birth, right? Correct. And that's home or hospital. Yeah. So there's the primary midwife, which... Um, attends the birth from the early onset of active, so four centimeters or greater, who monitors the mom and the baby throughout the labor. And then once the delivery is imminent, um, we call our second midwife. And she's an extra set of hands, documentation, takes over the monitoring. Okay. Uh, would there still be a nurse in the hospital, or do you guys do that as well? Um, generally in hospital we don't have a nurse, but on occasion we do. If things are precipitating quite quickly, um, or if we do have concerns, and on occasion there, are, there is a nurse there, but not very often. They provide emotional support and guidance. 
Uh, if birth plans change in labor, continual support and options are provided. Following the birth, midwives remain to monitor the mother and the newborn for two hours. Is, it, is that a strict regulation or do you guys stay longer? Well, that's, that's minimum two hours uh, because that's the greatest risk of postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, if there is concerns with it, and I'm staying longer, then we most likely would transport it to the hospital. Uh, but it's pretty standard two hours. And that way there, if there's any suturing that needs to be done, we need to make sure her bleeding's under control, she's enough to avoid, that the baby's doing well. Um, but it's pretty standard two hours. Perfect. Then you provide care for mom and baby until six weeks postpartum, right? Yeah. So first 24, then the day three, day five, two weeks, and six weeks all at home. Awesome. Two weeks, four weeks, and six weeks are into our office. Oh, into the office. Yeah. Okay. So what happens if there are complications? In pregnancy and labor, complications sometimes do arise. Midwives are trained to identify problems. Right? Uh, they would consult the appropriate healthcare professionals. Midwives carry the necessary equipment to monitor maternal, fetal, and newborn health, as well as equipment to manage obstetrical and postpartum complications. Um, you see some of the equipment that they do carry in the next couple slides. Uh, they provided us this at the uh, training we had back in the summer, so some live pictures. Uh, there's a question that came in, what percentage of your patients choose to deliver at home? Um, here in Windsor, we have um, a fairly high home birth rate. So we're doing about 30% of our births planned at home. 30%. Now, that's increased, uh, obviously, over the last couple of years. Um, I'd say probably still about 30%. Yeah. Awesome. So, midwives are prepared and trained to respond appropriately to emergency situations, and they update their skills on a regular basis. So, they do do, it should say NRP, not uh, NPR. Sorry, that's my mistake. And CPR really early. That's like a U.S. video <laughs> <laughs> thing, right? <laughs> Uh, they have emergency skills workshops every two years, and they need to maintain skills to deal with emergencies prior to the arrival or assessing of specialized medical care. Touch on that a little bit. Um, and our college is fairly strict. We re um, recertify with the college every year, and if your skills are not up to date, you cannot renew um, your registration. Now, is there a fee for renewing your registration? Oh, you of course, there's a fee for everything. Oh, so you said paramedics do the same thing. Right. Every year. Every year we do our basic research and involve touching on everything. So, so midwife scope. So they also administer medications such as IV fluids, epinephrine, epinephrine, diaminohydronate, epinephrine, oxytocin, antibiotics, interprostal, hemodate, oxygen, nitrous oxide, provide analgesia. And then narcotics, but they do the narcotics with a physician order and consultation? Correct, yes. So the physician would order it and then we can administer it. In terms of the epidural, we order it and then obviously it's an anesthesiologist who does the procedure. So you carry a little narcotics pipe when you go through? Or? Not at home. So the any form of pain relief, we would be in hospital at that point. Um, what we carry at home is IV fluids, oxytocin, um, if they're GBS known positive, we do um, have an order. The patient does have a uh, 10G, um, but we do carry the as a possible and of eight. So, so one of the advantages to go to go in would be the, the pain. So, what do you do to control pain at home? Non-pharmacological stuff. <laughs> um, massage. Shower, massage, <laughs> continuous support, um, birthing tub. So, essentially, at home, it's the unmedicated, healthy client. If you have any risk factors, then it rules you out for a whole birth. What are some of the types of risk factors? Um, slow growth, preterm labor, um, placenta previa, pregnancy-induced hypertension, gestational diabetes. All the fun stuff. Yeah, prolonged rupture of membranes, yeah. depending on what your community cutoff is. We have a question that came up from Alan Kuntz. Uh, sorry about that. Do you carry DPITs? Is the question? No, we do not. No, we do not. Why not? Not in our scope of practice. Not in our scope. Of, okay. Well, what if it's a really old woman giving birth who's got chest pain? We call you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then she'd be ruled out from a home birth. Yeah, there's not a lot of ventricular fibrillation or VTAC arrest or anything where 
talking to somebody would be an advantage. But I think the, the advantage would be monitoring equipment, which if you carry that to look at um, vital signs and things like that. Okay. Uh, the Canadian Association of Midwives provides continuing education emergency skills uh, within the midwifery context, both in hospital or home slash out of hospital settings. As you can see, there's there's going to be three pages. I'm not going to read them all to you. Uh, we're going to go through, you know, we'll spend some time on each slide just so you can very quick read. Presentation will be available online uh, once we're done. So. So, so, so seriously, people could would have like undiagnosed twins, like they would get to the point where... It's very rare nowadays that you're going to have undiagnosed twins or undiagnosed breach because of the availability of ultrasound. Yeah. There are certain communities like the Mennonite population who might not necessarily always have um, ultrasound. It's going to kind of be in those situations, but we would try our darnest to avoid any of those situations. Now, do you ever get do you ever get cases where they they call you as a midwife and maybe um, they're kind of a recent immigrant or they're new into the community and they might not have had all of the the uh, Absolutely. Um, because of where we're situated, um, we do have a lot of recent immigrants um, into our care because we can provide uh, prenatal care without OHA because we're funded by the Ministry of Health. Um, our hospital is pretty good to get us into ultrasound fairly quickly. But there are times that our hospital will call us if um, there's a patient who goes up who's term and in labor and she doesn't have OHIP phone call. So there are those situations, but in those cases we're generally in hospital. We have another question that came through uh, from Kevin. It says, uh, midwives seem to be more prominent in the Lindsay area versus anywhere else in Ontario. Is this a false perception? I would think it's a false perception. We're, we're, um, we're all over the place. I think it just depends on how involved we, the midwives are in their community based on their hospital relationship. Um, but we're, we're fairly loud up here. Fairly loud. <laughs> I, that's a good thing. Um, These are all deaf. <laughs> As you see, we're going through the next couple slides. It has the, uh, why would a midwife call 911? All right. And some of these are urgent, and some of these we would go non-urgently into hospital. What, what is your most urgent? Um, probably McCone stain fluid with um, an abnormal fetal heart rate. Uh, yeah. So undiagnosed twins, it, we would call you guys to transport in. Um, Undiagnosed breach for sure. Uh, pain relief if she's not coping well. So it wouldn't be urgent, but if we can't get her um, to go in to go in via car, then we would call you guys. Meconium, um, depending if, if the fetal heart rate is normal and the delivery is not imminent, there are occasions that we do go in by car. Um, gestational hypertension if she developed it throughout the pregnancy or sorry throughout the labor, we definitely would call you guys. Obviously, abnormal presentation, a little bit more urgent, and then abnormal fetal heart rate. Okay. Third page of happiness. Um, maternal shock, yes, you probably give us a shout. Um, what about, like, the infant's less than 2,500 grams? Depending on how stable the infant is. If there's temperature instability, respiratory distress, we definitely would call you. Um, we wouldn't necessarily always call you guys for, for that one. Um, and then the cord was less than three vessels, depending on how the baby's doing. They're generally associated to um, slow growth, these infants. Um, so we may not necessarily call you guys for that, but we do arrange for pediatric consult postpartum. Um, abnormal findings, depending on the extent of them, would depend on if we would call you or not. And obviously, we would call you for sure for persistence. So I know it says temperature instability, respiratory distress. Um, our community protocol is if we are bagging and masking a baby, we are calling you guys. Um, because of that 3% that need resuscitation, about 1% need extensive res uh, resuscitation. All right. Uh, a question just came through. Uh, how would you manage placenta previa? Uh, we would not be at home, first off. Um, it would be identified on an ultrasound between 18 to 20 weeks. That would be followed up by an ultrasound at 32 to 34 weeks. That patient there uh, would be a booked cesarean section, so we would consult um, one of the obstetricians in our community, and she would be a transfer of care to them. Okay, perfect. So I guess now we're going to get into the uh, controversial part. Who's in charge? <laughs> right, I always got out a little controversy. These things get people interested. Uh, 
So as for the 2007 BLS standards of care, which is our Bible under Section 516, it says paramedics and midwives will work cooperatively in making decisions and providing quality of patient care to mother and neonate during an out-of-hospital birth. All right. Upon arriving the scene, where a person is assisting the mother. Now, obviously, it says person. Now, I know there's registered midwives, but there's also doulas. Right? Yes, doulas are labor support individuals, and they would not be in charge. They have no medical training whatsoever, and therefore, you guys would be in charge. Okay. So, when we arrive as paramedics, we need to con confirm, obviously, the nature of the request for an ambulance and who requested the service. Right? Was it mom? Was it the midwife? Right? The patient's condition and the progression of labor and delivery and then the capacity of the person assisting the birth. So that's where they ask that question, are you a midwife or are you a doula or, you know. And generally when you guys walk in, we identify who we are, what we're doing, and what the purpose of our call is. We learned that um, dispatch does not let you guys know that, who's calling and <laughs> what you guys are walking into. Yeah. Uh, I've got a quick question that came in on pain relief. It says there's no standing orders for anesthesia in pregnancy. A BHP pack required, how willing will the BHP uh, be willing to give a narcotic order, Dr. Bradford? You mean, if, well, if the midwife was there, then we would uh, support her with uh, her recommendation. Okay, but what if we were just as paramedics and transports to the hospital? Would you give us an order for pain relief? No. No? There you go. That's the question. <laughs> There's the answer. No. <laughs> so an identified midwife is present at the scene. The paramedics will. Right. Well, part well, of the reason we wouldn't know, is just to explain that a little further, okay. is that um, the narcotics that you're going to give are going to be passed on to the baby. So, you know, depending on your assessment or how much of a detailed assessment you've done on presentation to know when the child's going to be um, delivered, there's a window where you can give narcotic uh, pain relief and then you could be past that window, in which case the baby could be born flat, right? And depending on uh, what tools and resources and your access to the baby to deliver Narcan or something else, you may, that may be a challenge for you, right. right? So we don't want to make a difficult situation worse, right? No, absolutely. That's, what is the window? What is the time frame? Well, the, the, the narcotics last, like the half-life last of uh, narcotics three to four hours, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, something like uh, morphine, look something like fentanyl is uh, uh, more short-acting. Right. And those would be the two that, that you most commonly carry for narcotics. Um, and I, don't, I wouldn't imagine you'd want to sedate anyone. No, <laughs> no, thank you. Never said, you know, but but that's that's the issue. So you might, you know, if someone's on their third baby and you know you give them some narcotics, that could be an issue for you having a flat child, right? Actually, so an identified midwife is present at the scene. Uh, the paramedic will confirm the patient with the patient that this person has been retained to assist them. A key question. Sometimes I, you know, people may just show up out of the blue, right? And then confirm that the midwife present is registered with the College of Midwives if she's not or he is not known to the paramedics. All right. So who's in charge? Just stated earlier, there's really no charge. You work cooperatively in providing uh, the quality of care for the patient and or the neonate at the scene and through transport to the hospital. Midwives are allowed. It is right in the BLS standards of care and expected to be transported in the ambulance to continue the patient care to the hospital. Very similar to the physicians on scene, you can assist the paramedic within the paramedic scope. You can phone the BHP or they or use their scope of practice and accompany as the physician on record. Yeah, so, so I put that uh, paragraph in there because I think that's a great way for, for paramedics to kind of wrap their head around this. Um, the person who decides where the ambulance goes is the person holding the steering wheel, right? So you know they're going to decide that. And, and if you had a cardiologist and say you know you were in Essex and uh, you know that that person happened to be there and, and there was EKG changes showing an acute MI, right? The cardiologist would say, well, I want you to take that person to Leamington. It's closer, and I know my buddy there who works as a cardiologist, and I can get this person seen right away. But you know from your destination protocols that the safest thing to do would be to take this person in straight to the cath lab, right? As a paramedic. So there's an example of where, you know, this cardiologist who does, you know, maybe outpatient work, who's maybe a great physician, a great doctor, is not fully aware of the pre-hospital system, the emergency medicine system, and acute cardiology care necessarily in the community, right? They might be kind of doing stress tests and things like that. So, so it's important that the paramedics are experts on destination protocol, 
they're experts on kind of what's going on with the hospitals. They may know that a scanner's down at one hospital, not the other. They have this real-time information to affect their situational awareness to make those kind of decisions, right? And they're also understanding the ambulance act and understanding about the status of the patient, and that you know if their if their baby is, uh, for instance, VSA or something like that, they would know that you know the 22 blocks from one hospital to the other, you know, they would understand the difference in time, not just distance, right? So you know they have that key key knowledge. Now the the physician or uh, midwife in the back can can assist with their scope of practice or can take over the care, uh, but they would be responsible for that. So for for instance. Um, if you did a delegated medical act or something that's within your scope as a healthcare practitioner and then you hand it over to paramedics and they did not have that skill training, you would be you know, responsible for that care under your college. So it's important that you would then be there to maintain the care that you have initiated. So as a physician, if I intubated a patient, right, I would then have to hop in the back of the ambulance and manage that airway if I handed over that care to a PCP crew. Right? That would be unfair to expect them to manage that. And we certainly had issues where uh, we've had transfers where that's happening in our community. Uh, a good example of that would be uh, transfers from Windsor Western, right, where the person has trachea, uh, tracheostomy, and there's been suctioning involved and that type of thing. So, so this is where the scope uh, matters, right? But it's it's still pretty critical that uh, the paramedics have that key knowledge and uh, and, and utilize and assist the, the people that, that are managing the care in that case. And I think often this comes down to common sense. Okay. Perfect. So, as Dr. Blyford explained, it's very similar to physician situation. Should the midwife's care or management of the patient and or infant be contrary, in contradiction to the approved BLS standard of care, paramedic will, with the patient's consent, assume full control of the situation, then consult the BHP where needed. Um, with the patient's consent and patient care and transport is obtained, the paramedic ultimately is responsible for the welfare of the patient, regardless whether or not the paramedic utilizes the midwives expertise or experience. Trust me, I'd like to rely on that more than me. All right. You know, it's kind of funny, but if you show up at a hotel, dude, and you could have an ax in your head, you know, as a trauma patient or something like that, and so you have a room two, there's an ax in the head. If you show up giving birth, it's like they lose their minds. You know, oh my god, right? Like yeah. it's sort of, uh, so I guess it's all, uh, you know, what's in your comfort of what you're used to seeing. and. Um, Certainly, you know, I think you want to take advantage of that, of that expertise. And then, once the call is completed for an out-of-hospital birth, uh, with the midwife present, the paramedic will need to note on their ACR the midwife's presence, their involvement, what they did, and include their name. All right, so they throw that in the remarks section, so that there is a record, and we know what's uh, going on and happened. At this time, uh, this concludes our little bit of the presentation. Hope it was. Uh, informative. We'll take any questions that you may have. You can fire them to Michelle and she'll zip them over to us. It'd be great. And uh, just so you guys know, we did uh, like to thank Natalie Pichet for attending today and providing her midwife experience and perspective on the exciting times in a patient's life. Also for providing us with information and the perspective of where our auto hospital care is going for the future. Is there any, like, any other tidbits you want to add or give to us? No, I think we've covered most of it, and um, I do thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and break down maybe some of the misconceptions around home birth and who we are and what we do so that you actually recognize that we are trained individuals specializing in pregnancy, labor, and birth, um, and break that misconception that we show up with a black bag with potions. That's not who we are, um, and that we are providing home birth to the healthy population and not the high-risk population. And what, I'm um, going to ask the first question. So, so um, where would you say uh, Permax have helped you the most? What kind of things do they do that help you the most um, on a call? When they're, when they're calling? Um, IV starts. We love when you guys come and do IV starts for us. Um, so, for instance, in a postpartum hemorrhage, if there's two of us um, and say I'm the primary midwife, so I'm the one trying to get the bleeding under control, and according to my emergency skills training, I'm having to do bimanual compression, my hands are fairly tied, where my second midwife is trying to do other stuff. So it's nice when you guys get there um, and start that ID for us so we can get the oxytocin um, running. Or if um, in our community on occasion we call you if my second midwife hasn't arrived, so it's nice to have an extra set of hands 
um, for documentation, for, for drawing up our meds, for administering certain things for us. Excellent. Okay. And just so you all know, this was well referenced. Okay, we've contacted the midwives across Canada, and uh, all their um, what do you call it? Books, uh, so books, <laughs> associations, <laughs> references, websites. Uh, if you guys want to do some online reading, there's a lot out there. I found out a lot involved in this program presentation, along with uh, Natalie and Dr. Bradford's advice and whatnot. I hope uh, you guys had fun. I know it's trying to do, uh, trying to get some email questions through here. I don't know why it's not updating for me. And I do want to clarify, um, the scope of Midwives is very community-based. Um, here in Windsor we work full scope midwifery, so we do a lot of these things um, that we did go through today. But there are certain communities that the scope of practice is a little bit more narrow, so a lot of things um, they may not be doing at home. For instance, um, a patient with a high BMI. In our community, we're quite comfortable to provide that option of home birth, um, whereas in certain other communities, um, the obstetricians may have narrowed their scope of that patient. There would be a transfer of care. Um, so there is lots of variation um, throughout the province. Okay, there's a question that came through. It says, uh, midwives must have a college ID number. Would you be able to provide that or oh, absolutely. On our, for our ACR and our documentation purposes? And here in Windsor, we always provide that number um, to the team that arrives. So I want to explain the slide. Um, <laughs> so, so I, I believe um, we were we were dem we're in the middle of the workshop, and we were demonstrating um, there's situations where there's a prolapse cord, and um, there's a there's an important uh, maneuver where the head has to be pushed up um, inside the mother to get pressure off the cord so that the baby can continue to be perfused. And uh, so, so this would result in um, the patients um, having uh, their head down and their um, posterior up in the air uh, with a hand inserted inside them, you know, to kind of push the head back. And we were kind of reviewing the difficulties in transporting a patient in this position. And, uh, you know, and have you guys ever had that, that kind of case? Or? Fortunately, knock on wood, we've, we've never had it here in Windsor. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure there probably will be the day, like anything else, that we do run into that situation. Yeah, I mean, it, it felt very uncomfortable. I didn't feel very well restrained, uh, you know, during that maneuver. So I think that would be a pre-hospital challenge. Pete, you want to talk about a little bit about how you would restrain somebody on a stretcher with? Uh, I think that would be our best way there. I don't know of any other way to secure <laughs> that position. I'm, I'm so sorry. Maybe we could arrange yeah. for you to kind of. You know, get a, my my view on it. You know, so that you could. Uh, I think we have your view on it right here. So, uh, there's another question that came through. It says, "How familiar are midwives with the scope of a PCP versus an ACP? So, our primary care paramedics versus our advanced care paramedics." Well, I mean, during we we kind of reviewed that a little bit during our workshop, um, but uh, I don't think with dispatch you can really ask for one or the other, right? So, so do you just kind of assess when you arrive, kind of what their skill set is? Or? We hope that when we call and identify what we're calling for, that they, they're sending us the appropriate people. I think in certain communities, um, they, they do ask um, for the level of paramedics. I believe it's only level three paramedics so that get into base. That's the That's advanced care. Advanced care? Yeah. yeah. I can provide information for you. You're talking about the stripes on their... Uh, it could be three, it could be two, and yeah. they're, they're changing them on a regular basis. So, uh, Another question that came through, it says, uh, do midwives use oxytocin for both the progression of labor as well as the postpartum? Um, in terms of progression, so we're, we're needing oxytocin, then um, it is it's classified as slow progress, and in that case there, we would not be at home, so we would be in hospital. We would have consulted a physician to get that oxytocin drip going. In terms of the postpartum, we do um, use it as an anti-hemorrhagic drug. We either give it intramuscularly, or if we're concerned, we would set up an IV and run an infusion at home. But in that case there, we would be transporting it to hospital if we have to set up an IV. Okay. And another question, uh, will there ever be a case where EMS is called to the scene by a midwife and then end up not transporting? Absolutely. Um, because of our guidelines here in Windsor, that as a practice we've collectively put together, for instance, um, 
one of the case, one of the situations would, would be shoulder dystocia. Uh, we're all trained to, through emergency skills to do eight maneuvers. If we have to do two, which are the basic maneuvers of um, shoulder dystocia, we would call you guys um, in case we ran into a postpartum hemorrhage or needing to resuscitate a baby. Uh, a lot of times those two maneuvers get the baby out and everything is just fine, so we would not transport in. Um, another situation would be neonatal resuscitation. So the minute we pick up the bag and mask, we call you guys. If you get there, but the baby is fine, then we wouldn't necessarily transport in. So there's a couple different situations. Okay. Can a midwife puncture the membrane and induce labor? Um, we can, yes, artificially rupture membranes. We do carry the amnia hook at home, um, so we can do that at home. Well, there's questions that are coming through, just bear with us. And how many, how many midwives are in uh, Essex County now? Um, there are a total of seven midwives, seven of which are in our office. There's a solo practicing midwife. And Kent County doesn't have any here. She works out of Wheelington. Okay. Yeah. But the nucleus are here in the city of Windsor. Yes. Okay. And your office is located? Eugenie McDougall. Eugenie McDougall. Mm -hmm. Do you have one obstetrician that kind of works with you more than the others, or um, does medical directors or anything like that? Or no, we work quite well with all of them um, because our our obstetricians do twenty four call in house. Uh, we kind of get whoever's on call. Um, but for more, for less urgent things, then we do selectively pick the obstetrician based on their expertise or their specialty versus what we need. Oh, right. And you have students too, right? Don't you have yeah. Sometimes? Yeah, we do have um, students in our office, so we're a teaching practice here in Windsor, um, and they come in different levels of their training at different time periods of the year. And they're from Hamilton? like the Hamilton, um, Toronto, or Laurentian, or Sudbury. Now, now, what about paramedics? Would you take them on as students and or go hang out in the uh, office and help do assessments or anything like we that? We have never done that here in Windsor um, because of the way the midwifery program is set up. There is a director based out of, I believe she's in Toronto, um, who does the organizing of placements. I'm not going to say no, but we've never done it. Um, at this point in time, we haven't received any new questions, so we're going to maybe give it another minute or so if there's anything else out there. If not, uh, I'd like to thank Natalie, Dr. Bradford, for attending this morning. Hopefully it was informative. Um, as Dr. Bradford changes the screen <laughs> <laughs> for it. Um, if there is any questions or anything, you can always email us and we'll get back to you. But uh, thanks again, Natalie, oh, for welcome. coming in and providing us with that information. Uh, I hope it was beneficial. And I think this was the biggest webinar we've had. I think nearly 60 people registered for this one this morning. So it went pretty good. All right, folks, we thank you very much. And I uh, hope you have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Bradford, for coming in. Thanks, Pete. And